Well, a very good evening. Um, it's Chris Barrow here, and uh, I'd like to welcome you, first of all, to the Barrow Bunker. And uh, I, I'd like to also thank you for taking some time out on Monday evening to uh, join me for this, which we hope is going to be the first of a series of webinars, uh, which we're going to be holding on a monthly basis uh, in conjunction with our very good friends at CFAST. And thank you to them for uh, allowing us to make this uh, available to you. And what I wanted to do, uh, I hope that this is going to be very informal. Um, and I also hope uh, that you'll be able to uh, enjoy some of the stuff that we're looking at. Uh, in this evening's webinar, where we're looking at financial controls, I will, during the course of the evening, be making reference to some spreadsheets. And uh, in order to make the webinar work, uh, the technology of the webinar work, what has to happen is that I'm sharing with you the, uh, the desktop on my computer here in the Barrow Bunker, uh, but what the, uh, the technology actually shrinks the size of your screen down to about half the size of my big screen. And so when we're looking at the spreadsheets, um, I'm going to blow them up as fast as I can, as, as big as I can to make them recognisable. But up on the top, le top left hand side of your screen, you should see a blue button that will allow you to uh, zoom in. Uh, so if you have any trouble seeing any figures later on, with the uh, with the uh, spreadsheets, uh, then just use the zoom button and see uh, whether you can uh, follow us that way. The other thing also um, is that we do have a chat box on here. Uh, now I am aided and abetted this evening in the background by my son John Barrow, who is our marketing coordinator uh, here at Seven Connections, and John's also sitting uh, in an even deeper bunker than I am, uh, looking at the technology. And if you type questions. Um, as we go through the um, webinar, then he will make sure that those questions are brought to my attention. And uh, if I can answer them quickly, I will do. And I'm quite happy to take questions as we go through the presentation. So those are your housekeeping points. Uh, let's see where we go. This was scheduled to run for an hour. Um, what I wanted to do, um, I'm having a, a trying very hard to have a year off PowerPoint this year. I'm a bit fed up with PowerPoint. And so what you'll be uh, seeing this evening is that I'll be using a, a particular mind mapping application that we use, which is called MindMeister uh, at mindmeister.com. Uh, really good stuff. Uh, it allows you to create uh, mind maps very quickly and also to uh, put them into presentation mode, which is what you're going to see. And uh, I'm going to run through with you what I believe are seven essential steps in gaining complete financial confidence in so far as the management of your dental business is concerned. By the way, I am not an accountant. Um, I don't understand double entry bookkeeping. I don't ever want to. Uh, so this really is finance for the non-financial. And uh, it's a real step-by-step -step guide uh, through uh, what should be happening. So I'm going to start with some really, really easy stuff. And then we'll move on to some of the more complex stuff as we move through the presentation. I will be sharing with you some spreadsheets and uh, one, an infographic. And if you want any copies of the spreadsheets or if you want any copies of the infographic, it's all uh, open source material. And uh, quite happy if you want to drop us a, an email after the gig and say, what a wonderful gig. Uh, could I have copies of the spreadsheets? Please do so. And we'll be happy to oblige. Uh, so let's start at step one. And step one, I don't actually have any fancy graphics for this. Um, I'm just going to deal with a very, very simple point. And in fact, any of you who read the blog, uh, which I publish on a day-to-day -day basis, sevenconnections.com forward slash blog, will know that this morning um, I published a, a blog post on this very subject. And that is the subject of receiving a monthly profit and loss statement or a set of management accounts, the terminologies mean the same thing, um, either from your in-house financial manager uh, or from your in-house bookkeeper or from an external bookkeeper or accountant. Nowadays, what I'm discovering is that the 21st century dental practice are running their accounts uh, are either on Sage or on QuickBooks or increasingly, I'm beginning to see some practices that are running their accounts on cloud-based uh, software systems. The most popular one at the moment is called Xero, that's X-E-R-O. 
zero accountancy software. Go and take a look at it. It's very, very uh, competitively priced. It's easy to use and it can produce all sorts of amazing uh, reports, uh, that many of which in actual fact will cover the, the material that we're going to cover in this webinar. So we're, we're moving into a world of cloud-based accountancy software. A lot of this software will plug into the back of your existing practice management software. So whether you're using R4 or Exact or any of the other proprietary systems, it's usual to create an interface between the two. For the non-accountants here, uh, a profit and loss statement is simply uh, a statement of how much money came in through the front door in the last month, and where did it come from, what type of sales were you making, and where did all the money go. It's a list of the variable expenses, that's the expenses that depend upon you doing some dentistry. Uh, that would be lab fees, material costs, implant components, and payments to associates, therapists, and hygiene. So it, it, the, those figures will vary from a month to month basis depending on the amount of business that you transact and who transacts it. And you've also got your fixed costs or your operating costs, which are the costs that stay pretty much the same month in, month out. It's your staff costs, it's the running costs of the building, it's the servicing of any debts that you've got, whether it's long term or short term debt. And it's all the bits and bobs, the utility bills and the newspapers and the postage and the stationery and the marketing spend and all the rest of it. Now, uh, my expectation with the clients that I'm working with uh, is that they're going to be able to produce that profit and loss management accounts within 14 days of each month end. And that not only that, but we're also going to be able to uh, produce figures year to date. So that as the year progresses, we begin to build up a, a picture uh, of what's going on within the business. It's no longer sufficient to just ring the bank on a Friday afternoon and find out how much is in the account and determine whether you're going to have a good or a bad weekend. Uh, you need to have a slightly more sophisticated analysis. So my first rhetorical question, which we mentioned in the blog post this morning, is do you get a monthly P&L? Now the second step relates to what you do with it when you get it, because there's no point in having a look at the top figure, how much did we sell, and taking a look at the bottom figure and which was left and then punching two holes in it and sticking it in a ring binder and putting it on a shelf and getting back into the surgery and doing dentistry. Hopefully we want to be able to do something a little bit more sophisticated than that. And this is where we start to consider the first of our spreadsheets this evening and that is a budget versus actual cash flow forecast. Now what I'm assuming here is that either you or the people in your organization are actually going to be uh, spreadsheet friendly. And uh, we're going to look here at an example uh, of the type of thing that we uh, would work with our clients on. If you're not Excel friendly, if you can't dance with an Excel spreadsheet, or if there's nobody in your organization that can, then somebody needs to get trained up pretty quick. And uh, what you can see here um, is that uh, on this left-hand side area, uh, this area here, uh, what we're doing is we are uh, setting out, first of all, and this is an example of a hypothetical practice, we've got dentists, one, two, three, we've got hygienists, one, two, three, we've got money coming in from a, a membership plan, and we've got sundry sales as well. And what's happened is that at the beginning of the year and on a month by month basis you can see that in this particular example the trading year for this practice begins in April and what we're doing is we're budgeting what we think each of the fee earners is going to generate on a month by month basis and in actual fact that might mean that you need to sit down with those fee earners and say okay uh, how many clinical get days do you expect to be doing on a month by month basis in the business this year? And how much do we, is it reasonable for us to expect that you will complete uh, in terms of production? So you can see that in this worked example, we've got actual figures uh, up until August, uh, but from September onwards, we're still in projection mode. We're projecting what we think the turnovers will be from each of the fee owners in the business. And then at the end of the year, we're projecting what we think the actual uh, turnover will be compared to the figure 
that we budgeted at the start of the year. Similarly, if we work down the list, we're now beginning to also look at what those variable costs would be. So we're budgeting uh, costs, excuse me, on materials, uh, budgeting costs on lab, and budgeting costs or payments to the individual dentists, uh, depending on the actual percentage contract that the individual dentists are on. And we're also budgeting what we think those uh, operating costs will be. So here you can see that we've created a 12 month forecast of what we think is gonna be happening in this practice. So if we look at the total figure, we think this practice is going to gross 958,000 in sales. We think that we're going to be paying 452,000 pounds in variable costs. We think that the overheads of the practice are gonna be 348,000 pounds and that by the end of the year, the practice is going to generate a pre-tax profit of 158 before the accountants start marching in and doing tax planning, which in this case is around about a 17% profit. Now, let me tell you, that's not a particularly brilliant result. Um, these are example figures based on um, a, a practice that we did some work for. We've taken out all the names to protect the innocent. But what we're doing is that we are budgeting what we think the month by month production is going to look like. And then as each year, at it, sorry, start again, as each month's profit and loss statement arises, then what we're going to start doing is we're going to start replacing what we thought was going to be the budget figure with the actual production that took place from each of those three owners. And then this spreadsheet will give us the variance. Red is bad, means that the variance is well below target. What we're also doing is we're looking at actual expenditure on variable expenses. And again, red is bad, we're way off budget. And then we're looking at all the individual overheads and replacing the budgeted figures with the actual figures. And again, we're, we're, we're picking up the red sides to say that was uh, either below, uh, sorry, above budget, I should say, in terms of expenditure, or it was an item expenditure that wasn't budgeted for. So on a month by month by month basis, uh, we're looking at what we think this practice is doing and we are constantly comparing. Imagine, if you will, uh, this is a yacht sailing across an ocean and no matter how hard we work, we know that that yacht is going to be affected by external influences, the, the tide and the wind, and we know that that yacht is going to be affected by internal uh, influences the set of the sail and the trim of the boat and so every single month we're taking a positional reading and we're discovering whether we're off course or on course and we're, we're making the course corrections that are necessary to get us back on our true course as often as we possibly can. Brings us then to item number three, hugely important and this is where we start to look at then the figures in a little bit more detail. And we start to look at what is known as key performance indicators. And in order to calculate a key performance indicator, a KPI, all that you do is you take the item of expenditure for that month. Let's take our lab fees for the month as an example. And let's divide that figure by the total turnover for the month so that what we have expressed is a percentage. If our sales were £10,000, and if our lab fees were £1,000, then lab is 10% of sales. And it's measuring those percentages on a month-by-month -month basis that will begin to identify any trends. If the cost of lab is gradually creeping up, you'll be able to see it as a percentage far more accurately than you can see as a range of numbers. You remember, we go back to that spreadsheet we were looking at. It's a little bit bewildering, all that lot. So what we've got to try and do is pull something out of there uh, that's going to look a little bit uh, simpler uh, for us to identify. And the way to do that is to look at those key performance indicators. Now, a lot of people ask me, well, what should those numbers be? Um, and so this is where we need to uh, take a look at uh, the first of our infographics today. And uh, what we're going to do, if I can remember how to pull it up, uh, just bear with me one second. Um, is we're going to take a look at, excuse me one second, I'll paddle around on here. 
uh, we're going to take a look. Why can't I get that old jump out? Um, Okay, pause for thought. There's a reason why I can't. There it is. There it is. Thank you very much. Found it. We're going to take a look here at uh, one of the um, small but growing number of Seven Connections infographics. We are starting to put these together with the help of our friends at Apex Hub. And we've got some very, very clever design people. And uh, this is one of four infographics that we, sorry, three infographics that we've produced so far. Our fourth infographic will be coming out on Wednesday this week, so keep an eye on the blog. Uh, we've got an interesting infographic on patient numbers in dentistry. But here's one we prepared earlier. And what you can see here is that this is an analysis of the benchmarks that you should be looking for in various types of practice and when I say various types of practice I mean various sizes of practice so what I've found in the last 20 years as I've traveled around Great Britain and Ireland is that around about 80% of the 10,000 independently owned dental practices in the UK seem to cluster around about a half million turnover give or take 10 or 15 percent and then around about 15 percent of all the independents out there cluster around 1.2 million and the remaining 5% uh, cluster around about 2 million in sales. So that's what it looks like. That's the universe of independent practices. And then way out at the edge of the solar system, you've got the corporates of hundreds, tens and hundreds of millions of pounds. But if you look at those uh, independently owned practices, you can see from the infographic that what I've done here is I've given you an indication in a mixed or private practice, that what I would what I would expect to see uh, as benchmark key performance indicators. You can see I'm not going to read all these figures out to you, but you can see uh, lab fees running between 10 and 14 percent of sales, depending on the size of the business. You can see staff costs running around 17 and a half percent until you get up to about two million. And it creeps up to 21% there because of 2 million turnover, you need to start employing some more managers. Now, I will take an aside on the staff cost benchmark. Those are figures that I've been measuring for 20 years. And what I've noticed in the last year or two, that those figures are beginning to creep up as a, by a couple of percentage points across the range. And that's the two reasons. First of all, because hygienists and therapists are now being taken onto the payroll. And secondly, uh, because dentists are employing treatment coordinators. And so as you move people from self-employed to employed, or if you hire new people like TCMs in the business, then those benchmarks will begin to creep up a little bit. So for hygienist therapists, add a couple of percent on for a good TCO, um, add maybe an extra percent as well. You can see I've got targets of net profit before tax there as well. And in fact, uh, the one thing that I didn't put on this infographic, and perhaps I should have done material costs, material costs tend to run in mixed and private practice at a pretty uh, constant 7% of sales, mixed and private, 7% of sales. Now, there's some other figures there that we'll come back to later on. You can see that I've, in, I've looked at the average daily production of principles in practices of various sizes. The average daily production of associates in those same practices. I want you to make a mental note, perhaps, of the fact that what I'm saying here is that 80% of associates in mixed and private practice are grossing about £800 a day. And that will come back as ha and haunt us a little bit later on in this presentation. You can see that I'm leading to the conclusion there that in order that an associate is profitable, meaningfully profitable, at those levels of production, you can see the percentages that I'm suggesting should be paid. And uh, no doubt that will cause a, an outcry from some of the people who are listening to this. And then finally, you'll see also what I observe as being the average marketing spend uh, as a percentage of sales uh, for practices of different turnovers. So 
Uh, the source of those figures, a couple of things. First of all, me spending the last 20 years driving around, uh, meeting new people and making the notes of the figures. Uh, and secondly, in constant conversation with specialist dental accountants uh, who give me the feedback and occasionally publish uh, those figures themselves. Those of you that are in uh, full air chest practice, uh, different set of numbers, and it might be something that I, I would need to communicate with you uh, independently of. So the key issue here uh, is that if I go all the way back to my uh, uh, spreadsheet from earlier on, uh, is that what we're actually doing um, is we're taking a look at uh, those key performance indicators on a month by month by month basis. Um, you've constantly got them in your sites, you're constantly reviewing them, and you're constantly asking yourself, how close am I to the benchmark for my type of practice? And if I'm off course, uh, is there something I need to be doing? about it. Let's move on to step four. And this is where we begin to deal with perhaps one of the most significant financial problems in the business of dentistry. Um, it's a soapbox that I've been standing on for about 12 years now and have had rotten vegetables thrown at me for most of that time, uh, but I'm still standing, as the song says. And uh, the only significant change is that I've noticed in the last 12 months there are more and more principles uh, coming around to uh, the view uh, that the percentages that are paid to associates in mixed and private dentistry are probably too high, and uh, in fact certainly too high, and need adjusting in a downward uh, direction uh, for all but a few producers. So as a precursor to that conversation, and we're gonna look at uh, a, a spreadsheet on that subject in a minute, uh, what I would say is that the first thing you need to do is start keeping count. And when you are keeping count of the production of um, other fee earners within the business. You are going to have to keep count of their fee per item sales. You are going to have to keep a nominal count of the average daily production of any membership scheme patients that you serve. And finally, of course, you're going to have to keep a, a nominal daily count of any UDAs that they deliver in mixed practice as well. So the key issue here is that somebody is collecting and collating that information so that on a month by month basis you are being supplied with a note of the average daily production of each of the fee earners in the business. And the reason for that is all about part five of this, which is to then analyze the profitability of each of those fee earners in the business to make sure that you're actually making some money. So uh, this is where we're going to take a, a look at uh, a second spreadsheet. And uh, you just bear with me a second while I get myself there. Um, we're going to start looking at uh, the infamous uh, associate profitability calculator. And again, forgive me moving this spreadsheet a bit just so that I can see it on my screen. Now we're going to have to fettle around with this one. I've blown it up as high, as high as I can so you can see it. There's quite a lot of information here. I'm going to uh, ask you to be patient with me whilst I walk you through what's going on. So we're going to start up here in the top left-hand column. I've got an example here of a four-surgery practice, one principal and three associates. And uh, for the sake of this example, I'm going to ignore any hygiene uh, contribution or hygiene department within the business. I just want to give you a simple example so you get the idea. And remember earlier, we were talking about the difference between variable costs. Those are the costs that arise when somebody turns up for some dentistry, lab materials and payments to fee earners and implant components. And the fixed costs of the practice, which were the costs that exist every single day, no matter who turns up, even if it snows, uh, you've still got to pay. Primarily staff wages, 
uh, we saw earlier from the infographic that that can be anything from 17.5% to 21%. But all the other costs of running the business, the uh, rent and rates and utilities and uh, compliance costs and the marketing and the postage and the stationery, add all that up. And in this full surgery practice, we calculated that and the predictable annual OBEDs came to £350,000. That's the operating cost of this business, whether or not any patients show up. We know that the practice is open 46 weeks a year, and we know that those four surgeries are open five days a week. So in actual fact, we know that we've got 920 clinical days available uh, in this practice each year. We're now going to look at the performance of one particular associate, and here's an associate who turns up 46 weeks a year, and is in fact working full time five days a week. So this associate is generating uh, 230 days a year uh, of dentistry for the practice. I don't know why this spreadsheet seems to be hanging a little bit and holding your breath. Right, so what we now know is that it costs 350,000 pounds a year to operate this place. And we also know that we've got 920 days a year of surgery. And so this leads us to a hugely important number in dentistry. And that is the operating cost per surgery per day. And you can see that in this example, uh, the answer there is 380 pounds and 43 pence. Now, let me tell you my experience that in a uh, four surgery practice, you would expect the figure to be about that level, about £400 a day in uh, what, what we'll call an, an average uh, mixed or private practice. Uh, what I'm also going to say is that one of the classic mistakes that dentists make is that they start doing what's known as shag pile and chandeliers. They start making the common areas of the practice look absolutely fabulous, darling. And they start also kitting out the place with all sorts of dental doodads. And they don't calculate what their operating cost for surgery per day is going to be. And I've been to some of these shag pile and chandelier places. I've been to some of the places that get featured in the dental magazines. This is how we did it. And it all looks like the Starship Enterprise and so on. And I suddenly find that these operating costs per surgery per day uh, are running at 500, 700, 800, even 900 pounds a day per surgery. And this is a mission critical number because if your operating costs per surgery per day get too high, it will kill you. Uh, because you'll be in a situation where no matter how much money you make, you can never cover your overhead. Let's take a look at this associate. Now, in actual fact, I'm, I'm going to change the numbers live and on screen. Let's take a guy or a gal that's actually generating production. Remember, I said that 80% of GDP associates in mixed and private practice are generating about £800 a day of productivity. We've calculated that this guy's lab fees are about 13%. Actually, that's probably quite unfair. Let's knock him down to 10 uh, because at 800 pound a day, he's not doing an awful lot of fancy dentistry. Uh, we've got his material costs are at 7%, uh, which is absolutely benchmarked. And you can see that this chap's on a 50% contract uh, and he's uh, paying there for 50% of his lab fees, but he's generating £800 a day. Now, there's all sorts of numbers here that we haven't got time to get lost in, but what we can say is this. Associate gross is 184000 a year. He's taking home £82,800 after the practice has paid for the lab, after the practice has paid for the materials, and after we deduct a contribution to overhead of... Uh, 380 pounds a day then you can see that in this example in actual fact the practice overall is losing just over 8,000 pound a year of production on this particular individual or in other words losing 5% of his sales now 
quickly, I'm going to say that there are people who say, well, there's more than one reason for having an associate in a practice. You, you have an associate because they will see the patients that you don't want to see. You'd have an associate because you want to take some holidays or go and do an MSc or get more postgraduate qualifications, whatever it is. You have an associate because you've got more patients than you can shake a stick at and you need somebody else to see them. That's all well and good. You have an associate because you're grooming somebody who might at some stage in the future be a successor. That's all good as well. But the reality is every day that this associate comes to work, you have to go home that night and sit down with your missus and say, just before we have dinner, have you got your purse handy? And your missus might turn around and say, why? And you say, well, you need to give me £36.43 of your housekeeping back today. And she says, why? And you say, because the associate came to work. Because somebody somewhere has got to put that £36.43 back into the business. And uh, unless the bank are going to keep lending it to you, it's going to be you. So my argument is I can understand all of the esoteric reasons why you would have an associate in the practice, but doesn't it make sense uh, that you would actually make some money? Now, of course, there's a blunt instrument approach, which is to say to said associate, we're going to drop you down to 45%, but that won't work because you're still losing 43 pence a day, so let's drop you down to 40%. And if we drop you down to 40%, uh, then in actual fact, we'll make a profit of £8,000 on the room. Now, I would argue that a profit of £8,000 on the room is actually pretty rubbish. In actual fact, think about this like a serviced office. If you had a room that was costing £380 a day to run, then what profit per day do you think you'd want to make on that room in order to justify having the room there in the first place and employing the nurses and employing the reception team and doing the marketing and turning the lights on and paying the rates for that room. Now, I think I probably want to make maybe, say, 20% profit on the room. I don't think that's unreasonable in a, in a small business. So if we're going to make 20% profit on the room, what that means is that that room is going to have to pay us about £80 a day uh, based on operating costs of 380 So what we're going to have to do in actual fact is take that associate down to 35%. And if we get to 35%, then it pays us about £70 a day. We're still not on target, but we're getting closer to. And that might explain why a lot of the corporates are now paying their associates the equivalent of about 35% based on their UDA production. Corporates aren't stupid. They've got lots and lots of people who are very good at sums and they've worked out what it's gonna cost them to make a profit. And that's why a lot of the corporates now are heading in the direction of 35% but for that level of production. By the way, an £800 a day associate in a, in a full NHS corporate is actually having a good day at work. It's a, it's a good level of production. But in the private sector, particularly with this particular one that's got 380 a day to pay for, it's not a good deal at all. Now, you may have noticed something that I conveniently um, omitted to mention. Oops, sorry. I've got to marks there, which is that if we go back to base, when this associate was on his 50% contract, you may recall that his take-home pay was £82,800, but if we now put him on his 35% contract, uh, he's, he's taken a bit of a hit, 82000 has become 58000 I think it's a reasonable assumption that said associate will probably move on to another practice that will pay him 50%. So that's a strategy that isn't going to work. And it isn't going to work because it's a, it's to make a lose winner into a win-lose where you're the winner and the loser is associate. That's no good. And so when I'm working with clients on this, one of the things that I say right off the bat is that there is absolutely no point in us uh, turning a lose-win into a win-lose. Nobody wins. The associate will walk. We've got to find a way of turning this into a win-win. So over on the right-hand side, let me propose a solution. And the solution I'm going to propose, and I need you to bear with me on this, just humor me for a bit, 
is that what we're going to do is introduce a sliding scale contract. And you can see here, this is the Chris Barrows Seven Connections recommended sliding scale. First 10,000 production pays you 35%. You then earn an extra 5% on every slice of 5,000 extra production. Now, let me put Ed to a classic mistake. I was with a client last week who had introduced a sliding scale that said if you get 10,000, you get 35, but if you get 15,000, you get 40 on the whole lot. If you get 20,000, you get 45 on the whole lot. Wrong, all right? What you've got to do is pay the percentage on the slice or else you'll find yourself back in the same problem. But you can see here that I've suggested that this associate's productivity can increase to 11 hundred pound a day a 300 pound a day increase in production if we do that and if we run it through the sliding scale you can see that the interesting reason i've chosen that is because the associate remuneration remains approximately the same 82 83 thousand becomes 87 thousand small pay rise not the end of there but the key issue is that the, the associate isn't earning any less money so when I start the meeting with the associate here, and I very often conduct these meetings with associates and principals, I show up and I manage the meeting, I'll say, the first thing you've got to understand is the objective of this meeting is not to give you a pay cut. The objective of this meeting is to leave your income intact. However, we've got to get rid of that £36.43 loss every day, so let's turn it into a profit. Now you can see in this example, that in actual fact, we've had a huge result because what's happened is that the £8,000 loss has turned into a £48,000 profit. And in actual fact, the daily loss has now become a £200 profit a day. Now, do you remember what I said earlier? A reasonable expectation was that you were going to make about £80 a day profit on the room. And the savvy associate is going to turn around and say, hey, you, you said you wanted £80 of profit a day on the room. You're making £210 of profit on the room per day. Do you not think that's a bit lopsided? And my answer is yes, you're absolutely right. So this is what I'm going to do. If you can hit £1,100 a day of productivity, I'm going to pay you through the sliding scale. You'll be earning the same as you were last time, but guess what? I'm gonna give you a piece of the action. If we generate 48,000 pounds of profit in that room after we've paid you, then I will share some of that profit with you in the form of a periodic bonus. And that could be monthly, although that wouldn't be my advice, probably quarterly or half yearly, or even in some cases annually. But what I'm doing is I'm giving my associates skin in the game to say that if we can work together to produce a much, much better result, then I'll share those additional profits with you. The $64,000 question is how the bejesus is the associate going to get from £800 to £1,100 a day? And the answer is we as a team in the dental practice are going to work together to make sure that you hit that level of productivity. As a team, we're going to make sure our brand is up to date. As a team, we're going to make sure our marketing is right on the money. As a team, we may bring treatment coordinators into the practice who can triage new patient inquiries and make sure that you're getting your fair share. As far as you are concerned personally, we're going to send you on Ashley Latter's Ethical Selling Course. Uh, we're going to invite you along to Chris Barrow coaching meetings. We're going to do whatever it is in terms of um, postgraduate education, first of all, to make sure that you can actually do the dentistry, but also to say that you've, you've been on some business skills development courses so that you've improved your communication skills and you've improved your ability to transact business. So we're not leaving the associate high and dry to try and figure out how the hell we're going to do it. We're working with the associate because we have a joint and vested interest in making sure that these levels of productivity are achieved. Now, frankly, at the end of the day, you know, 800 to 1100 a day, it's not a massive ask 
there's plenty of stuff out there in terms of short term although for goodness sake you could get an associate's production from 800 to 1100 just by sending them on the CFAS course and getting your marketing systems in place and say I'm going to share some of the CFAS patients with you even that alone would get you where you need to go but it would have a transformational effect on the bottom line and profitability of your business now I've spent a lot of time there because it's probably the most important thing that I want to look at today. <clears throat> and let me repeat where I started. Understanding your operating cost per surgery per day is a mission critical number. And understanding the profitability of each of the fee earners within your business is absolutely mission critical to the success of your business because otherwise you're going to be a slave to your own business you're going to be a principal generating 60 percent of the production through the front door and wondering why the hell you never have any money left at the end of the year and the reason is look at this red zone you're subsidizing the lack of productivity that exists within the rest of the fields so a lot of work there i spend endless hours with clients not only helping them to do the analysis in the first place but also and i think this is the most important thing i am not an associate basher i am an associate builder it's the job it's the job of the practice to make sure that those fee earners are best placed to be able to make a good living for themselves and also to make profits for the practice as well so let's move on to area seven and we're now going to go to an entirely different place, and that is to actually look at your marketing. Um, it isn't necessarily accountancy, but it certainly is numbers. Uh, my expectation is that you are going to keep a monthly spreadsheet, and that that monthly spreadsheet will show you, uh, in respect of every item of treatment that was sold, uh, where did that patient come from? How did they find the practice? Which particular marketing activity was it that brought them in through the door? Uh, what did they then buy? Uh, how much did they then spend? And therefore, what was the return on investment from our marketing activity? Now that's going to require somebody somewhere in the patient experience, whether it's a receptionist, whether it's a treatment coordinator, or whether it's a clinician, to ask a new patient a very, very important question indeed. And the question is, could you tell me how did you find the practice in the first place? And before you get carried away, when somebody says, I had a look at your website, it is absolutely essential that you then ask a second question and the question is could you please explain to me what exactly brought you to our spreadsheet in the, uh, to our practice sorry in the first place and the reason for that is because you know what we all look at the website if i see your a board on the pavement outside the practice i'll go and look at your website if i see a sign in your window I'll go and look at your website. If I hear a radio advert, I'll go and look at your website. If I see an advert in a newspaper, I'll go and look at your website. If my next door neighbor tells me you're a great guy, I'll go and look at your website. Everything actually funnels nowadays through your website because your website has now become the retail front door of your practice. And when we talk in next month's webinar about the seven keys to effective marketing, then we'll be talking about how to make that website a magnet for new patient inquiries. But for now, you need to ask, how did you find our website? Because that will give you uh, an indicator of which marketing activities are working and which are not. So you remember, you've got to tie the source of the inquiry to the spend in order to calculate the effectiveness and return. Now it presupposes that you have a marketing plan. So here's a sneaky peek, ever so quick sneaky peek, to a, a spreadsheet that we're going to look at next month in the marketing uh, webinar. Here we have a little example of a marketing plan for 2013. And what's happening here is that down the left hand side, uh, we've got all the activities that we could possibly think of that you're going to get involved in this year. 
welcome packs, pop-up cards, A boards, radio, blogs, social media, website development, and so on. And the idea is that on a month-by-month -month basis, you're actually deciding or you're mapping uh, wh what you're going to do each month uh, and deciding which month you're going to do it in uh, so that, in actual fact, you're building up what is a project plan, a Gantt chart inside Excel uh, so that people know what it is that they're supposed to do, when they're supposed to do it, and down at the bottom here, you can start then creating some budgets, some cash flows, what's this going to cost, and then transfer those, whoops, those budgets and cash flows uh, back into your budget and cash flow forecast uh, so that people can take a look uh, and estimate what it's likely to cost. Okay, so uh, my expectation is that on a month-by-month -month basis, you're going to measure your marketing return investment. And that brings me very nicely uh, to my seventh and final step in creating complete financial confidence. And that is to look very, very carefully indeed uh, at your conversion ratios on new patient inquiries. Now you can see on the slide here that I've said at number seven, it's TCO conversion ratios, and that's treatment coordinate conversion ratios. Why? Because I'm the self-elected president of the treatment coordinators fan club. And uh, I've been a huge supporter of the development of the treatment coordinator within practice for some years now. Um, and whether or not your treatment coordinators are like being trained by the great Laura Horton, who really occupies the footprint for this, or Tracy Stewart, who does some work on this, or our own Nikki Berryman, uh, who offers treatment coordinator training to Seven Connections clients. Um, whoever it is that's doing the training, there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that a correctly deployed treatment coordinator can improve the productivity of individual clinicians by up to 33%. So if we go back to that associate earlier that we wanted to get from 800 to 1100 pounds, we can do that by actually buddying that associate with a good treatment coordinator who can make sure the right patients are coming through uh, for the right treatment at the right price. So what I'm going to share with you now, again, is a spreadsheet that we use with our clients. And I am going to give credit where it's due to Laura Horton because she was the first person to start doing this type of analysis and was an inspiration to us uh, in the development of her business. Uh, and this is looking at... Uh, uh, how we can measure, I'm going to blow that one up a little bit for you, uh, how we can measure the activity uh, of your treatment coordination team on a month-by-month -month basis. So here we've got some uh, figures. They are real-life figures, uh, and uh, I've taken all the names out to protect the innocent. Now, let me explain what's happening in this practice. New patient inquiries are coming into the switchboard, in other words, step one, is telephony. Uh, num they, what happens at the telephony stage is that they, the new patient is offered the opportunity of a free consultation with a treatment coordinator. Once that free uh, uh, assessment has taken place, they are then offered a paid consult with a dentist. And at that point, the dentist and the treatment coordinator uh, will work as a team to uh, turn this into a new business opportunity. And, and you can see that what we've got here in actual fact in this example is a practice where we've got one, two, three, and a possible fourth dentist working alongside the treatment coordinator. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna squish along uh, to, whoops, to a, a, a bit further down the figures. Uh, let me just put some freeze frames in there in a minute. Let's just, move down the year a bit and let's look at some figures for uh, this year. Okay, so let's look at the trend here. Uh, first of all, number of new patient inquiries. You can see the numbers through there in each month. And secondly, the number of them that booked an appointment. Now remember what we're talking about there by an appointment is a free uh, consult with a treatment coordinator. And what we can see here 
is that the conversion rate has actually altered as the year's gone along. If we go back to the beginning of the year, we, we had a very much smaller number of new patient inquiries because this particular practice were only just getting their marketing engine going. And in actual fact, we were getting a very high conversion rate on those inquiries, a small number with a high conversion rate. But as you can see, as the year has gone on, we've actually started getting higher numbers of new patient inquiries because we've been putting some marketing systems in place. And so uh, 62, 48, 37, 42, 60, 45, fairly high inquiries, but the conversion rate from telephone to free assessment has actually become quite low. And so what this indicates to me is that we have a training opportunity to work with the telephony team to improve their skills, improve their language, give them the toolkit that they need in order to be able to convert a higher number of inquiries into um, free consults. And so this isn't something wrong with the telephony team, this is an opportunity uh, to work with them to improve their conver conversion skills. And I can say, by the way, in the case of this practice, that's already happened. Let's have a look at what happens when these patients come in for a free assessment with a treatment coordinator. And you can see, again, it's lumpy, and that's because dentistry, private dentistry, is a lumpy kind of business. Remember, some people take a while to come in. They, all, they don't all come in in the month that they call. So in January, we only had, we, we had a much lower percentage of, that came in for free assessment than happened in February, but we actually had much lower numbers as well. But what we're looking at is we're looking at the trend, and I would be looking at these figures over six months at a time, and I'd be calculating some averages. I'd be saying, okay, I want to take a look um, at uh, the average, for example. Let's take a look and work out an average based on uh, just these last six months, and we can see that the average conversion from telephony to free assessment is 38%. And if we just scroll down and sort of figures a bit, um, we can see, sorry, um, we can see that the average conversion of um, free assessments into paid consults is around about 54%. And that's not a bad result. Uh, what we're now going to do is we're going to look at what happens when the dentist gets involved uh, with the treatment coordinator and what happens very quickly indeed is that the numbers get very attractive because we can see that in this practice almost 70% of the new patients uh, who come in for that paid consult uh, actually go through with this particular dentist, this is dentist number one, uh, that 69% of them on average are going through to treatment. We can also see that the average value, whoops, no, we can't because I've messed up on there. <laughs> we can also, if I just do the uh, math here, uh, we can also take a look at the average treatment value uh, for that particular dentist. No, we can't because I've got the formatting wrong on the cells. Just bear with me one second. Okay, while we do a bit of live, let's get rid of general format. Go back there again. I'm probably going to do this live and make a mess of it. Um, okay, let me just try that one more time before I collapse in this embarrassed heap. Is that going to work? There we go. Good. So the average uh, new patient spend over that period was over £39,000. I'm sorry to take me a while to get there, um, but if I can, if that works, very good. And the average spend per new patient in this, uh, that sees this dentist is around 1,700 quid. So let me go back to the top. In this practice, for the six months to June, uh, then 38% of people who rang and made an inquiry booked in for a free assessment. That's a bit on the low side. We need to do some work. 54% of the people that came from a free assessment went through for a paid consult. That's a pretty good result. Can do better. Two thirds would be better, but 54 is good. Once the TCO gets them through to dentist number one, by the way, it's the principal, surprise, surprise. 69% of the people that come in for a paid consult go to treatment, and on average, they spend 1,700 quid an average result of 39,000 pounds.
So not a bad result. And it's the measurement of those stats on a month by month by month basis for all the dentists in the business that will actually give you the winners and the losers, as it were, the people who are already good at it and can be encouraged and supported, and also the people who need training, they need help. Okay, so let's go back to the spreadsheet and look at it in its entirety. What we've talked about here is, number one, make sure that you are getting a profit and loss statement on a monthly basis. Number two, make sure you've created a future cash flow forecast and that you are measuring budget versus actual on a monthly basis. Number three, make sure you are analyzing your key performance indicators every single month to identify trends. Number four, meticulously collect and collate the average daily production of each of your fee earners. And then at number five, make sure that on a month by month basis, you analyze the profitability of each fee earner because the biggest problem in independent practice is not the money that you're making or losing, it's the money that your associates, your hygienists, your therapists, and your traveling specialists are making or losing. Key critical operating cost per surgery per day. Number six, make sure you measure the return on investment from each of your marketing activities so that you can tell you what pays you and what doesn't. And finally, number seven, meticulous record keeping on new patient conversion figures so that you know where the strengths and the weaknesses are in the patient journey. What we have there is seven steps which, if they are correctly implemented, will, I believe, create a huge amount of confidence in your business and will, of course, ultimately translate down to a bottom line profit, which you would be very proud of. I hope that you have enjoyed uh, what I've had to say this evening and I hope that you'll join us for the rest of these uh, webinars. Uh, and like I said, whether you are watching this live or a recording, if you do need copies of any of those spreadsheets, then please do email us. Uh, coach.barrow at sevenconnections.com uh, or any of the rest of the Seven Connections team and we'll be happy to help. For now, I'm going to thank you for your investment of time this evening. I'm going to wish you a very pleasant rest of the evening. Thanks for joining and see you next time. Goodbye.